Welcome, Royal Family. We are in lesson number 82 in our Matthew series. If you guys want to turn to um, Matthew chapter 9, there's only one scripture we're going to look at in there. We're going to be going forward talking about the birth of sin. Um, because of Matthew chapter 9, the one verse in there opens up a whole doctrinal set of principles we need to look at. So we will begin this series on sin and repentance. Okay, that's what we're going to begin this on, the birth of sin. We have to go back to the beginning and take a look at that. So uh, I think we need to keep our, our, our fellow believers across Europe in prayer. There's a lot going on over there. I haven't discussed it lately and I haven't done any political commentaries because everything needs to open up. And uh, there's been a couple of people that asked me about that. And I put things out last year because I got really good information and I knew things were coming and I also, my personal studies uh, uh, that, that lead me in certain directions doctrinally could see things coming as well. So um, I would suggest go back, if you're interested in the political stuff, go back and look at the four or five of them I did in the last six or eight months of last year in 2018. And there were some interesting ones that I had in there um, right up to the predictions and everything else. But you, um, you really got to wait for things to open up. And it's unfortunate, but we're going to see a level of corruption and satanic... I, I believe um, satanic practices and satanic influence like you've never seen before. I think the eyes of the public are opened up concerning uh, the lies of the media, the lies of our political parties, both parties, um, and most certainly the far left progressives and, and their funding and who is behind them. So uh, there's reasons why I haven't jumped into too many political commentaries. I have to feel led to do them. As a pastor, 90% uh, of what I do is study and teach, study and teach. That's what I'm supposed to do. Um, the other small part, 10%, might be to be give my opinion or advice to somebody or a little bit of counseling, not much because pastors can't get involved in too much of that. We can talk about that on another day. But um, about 90% of what I'm supposed to be doing is studying to the point of exhaustion where I teach you the accurate principles and study and teach is what I'm supposed to do. So that is what I'm focused on. And occasionally I do put out some other things out there. They're kind of warning signs. Just for people I care about that are out there that I know are believers about what's coming, what I believe is coming. And uh, if you've read my book and looked at my political commentaries, you should be awake of, of what's going on and what's going to be happening. And don't be in shock. Just don't be in shock in, in the next six or eight months if things open up and you realize some people are into some pretty bizarre things. And the lies, how deep they run um, in our government and for how long and things that have been covered up, big historical things, uh, horrible things. So uh, I thank you for those the emails and the questions concerning that, but I have to do, go where God the Holy Spirit leads me. So having said that, we're in Matthew, Lesson 82, The Birth of Sin. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Let's take a moment of silent prayer, and we'll get ready to study the Word of God. Father, we thank you for this time we have to come forward to study your Word. We're asking you to bless those that... Take your word serious and want to take it out to a lost and dying world. The serious students, Father, the ones that really want to tear into your word and, 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 and eat it like it's the food of life and it gives them the nutrition in their soul and their body and their mind that they can go forward, Father. Those are the students who we're really trying to touch, Father. There are those who seem to be out there and lost, Father. We're touching, reaching out and trying to touch those and try to bring them back or make them become born again and saved, help them to see the light to become born again and saved. But, Father, we're asking your blessings for all these things, and we're asking also to reach out there in Europe and different areas across the world where Christianity is under attack, Father. It is under attack. We're asking these things through your Son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Birth of Sin, Matthew, Lesson 82. We will begin a series on sin and repentance. Uh, this, my royal family, will not be the legalistic repentance that some denominations teach. This will be a series that involves the principle of God's divine protocol for dealing with sin and mankind's responsibility within that protocol. Let me say that again. This will be a series that involves the principle of God's divine protocol for dealing with sin and mankind's responsibility within that protocol. This series all stems from one particular scripture that we have looked at recently, and God the Holy Spirit kind of opens up when you get into studying something, uh, a direction you need to go in, and this is the direction I feel led to right now. Matthew 9, 6. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, that he said to the paralytic, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. This title Jesus uses, we can see in Daniel 7.13. It's used in the Old Testament a few times, um, but it's really uh, kind of imperative to look at it in Daniel chapter 7, where the Son of Man title, the Son of Man title is a heavenly figure, both an individual and at the same time the ideal representative representative, excuse me, of the people of God, representing the people of God. In the Jewish apocalyptic tradition, this son of man 
is regarded as a pre-existent one who will come at the end of the ages, at the end of the ages as a judge and as a light to the Gentiles. So it's kind of written in their scriptures as well. They just don't understand he's already come and been on the cross. The Son of Man is none other than who? Jesus Christ. So that Son of Man title he uses, Jesus Christ, the unique God-man of the universe. And I'm going to put Daniel 7, 13, and 14 on the board so we can uh, look at what I'm talking about here. Prophecies, Daniel, deep, deep prophecies, especially concerning end-time events. In Daniel 7, 13, I kept looking in the night visions, behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man, resembling man, human form, was coming. He came up to the Ancient of the Days, and he was presented before him. This is all heavenly visions. This is a, this is a human entity of some form Daniel's having a vision of. Jesus used this term often, and it had a dual meaning. First, to point to his humanity. That's one of the first things it points to. And the unique union he actually has with mankind, with us. And there is no doubt this prophecy in Daniel chapter 7 is none other than the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Look at Daniel 7, 14. And to him was given domain, glory, and kingdom. Who? This one that this vision he's having. This is Jesus Christ. That all the peoples, all the nations, men of every tongue might serve him. Who is that? Jesus Christ. His domain is an everlasting domain which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. This is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Is there any doubt that this is the Lord Jesus Christ? It was a term Jesus used often in the New Testament. Son of man. So, you know, it's something we need to deal with a little bit and look at. Now, when dealing with the arrogance of the Pharisees and the questions from, like, the high priest, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, announced exactly who he was. We see that in Mark uh, chapter 14, verse 62. And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man, there it is, sitting at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus also uses this title when he emphasized that his authority and power in the sense of a divine throne that he was seated upon, and he will continue to be seated upon, obviously. And remember, it is a bloodline of David that we look at, for the royal bloodline of David that fits the prophecy of the eternal king. So there's a lot of uh, royalty in all of this title as well, and we know Jesus Christ being the king of all kings. Jesus using Son of Man was a loaded statement. It's a loaded statement that says, I am King of Kings, I am Lord of Lords in the human realm, but also in the power and the throne in the heavenly with God the Father. That's what he's saying. I am just as much human as I am God. And this reference also, we can touch on to what I would say the hypostatic union, the doctrine of the hypostatic union. I'm going to have you guys turn to Genesis chapter 3. I wanted to clarify that Son of Man title. There are people that ask those questions. Son of Man was also a source of comfort, when you think about it, that title, that the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is one of us. And certainly with his apostles, he needed to bond and assure them that he's going to be with them and understand their, their human frailty, that he would understand them. To begin this series, though, looking at this series, now that I explained the title a little bit, it'll be important to look at the beginning of sin, entering into mankind, how God deals with sin, how where it came from at the beginning you want to, when you really want to tear into something, especially biblically, sometimes you have to go all the way back to the first time, first mentioned principle in the Bible, because that's very key. When the first mentioned principle comes in, that means it's something being established in God's divine order. And unless he tells you different, you do not change it. You do not change it, okay? Genesis 3.1. Let's look at it together. Let's read it together. You're familiar with it, but let's read it. And it, there's a lot of deep principles in here. We're not going to get into all of them. Our focus is going to be on the sin issue, though. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Asking a question. Immediately, we see Satan twist scripture. Immediately, he twists scripture. He plays with the truth. He uses it. He plays with it. He toys it. He manipulates it. Actually using truth mixed with a lie to begin confusion and to introduce sin. And to inflame, if there's a sin nature in there, he's going to pull it out because he knows within his own self, he fails, he sins. So he's looking at man as a lower race saying, I can pull that nature right, I can pull that sin, that nature right out of him. Genesis 3, 2. The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, verse 3, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. A little change there little change from the original, what God's original command was. Now the woman is off track right there. Just a little bit, but that's all it takes. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. She's off track because that's not exactly what the Lord said to the man and woman. See, the old sin nature, and all of us have it, right? It has a strong appetite toward adjusting truth, taking Bible doctrine and truth to suit its own needs, twisting it, manipulating it, 
for some kind of gold or to suit our own lust patterns, our own needs, it becomes frustrated. The old sin nature will become frustrated when the Word of God is shined upon it very brightly, and it'll lash out with these lies of manipulation and anger, which usually follows. It might start with some lies, manipulation, twisting things. Then there'll be some frustration that comes, some more lies of manipulation. Eventually, anger will come out when the hot, white, hot light of the truth of Bible doctrine shines on it. You can count on it every time. The old sin nature always, always relies on rationalization to justify acting out. All of us, think about it. The old sin nature always wants to rely on justifying, rationalizing things and justifying things. Why I did this. Because of you, I did that. Because of this, I did this. There's a lot of that in the old sin nature. We know that. So you're going to see it and witness it right here. It's Genesis 3, 4. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. Exclamation. He said, no, no, I know better. I, I'm very intelligent. Listen to me. There's a spiritual death. There is a spiritual death that took place. That is where Satan's lies are so very misleading. They released, they, that he actually helped to release the old sin nature in all of this. Genesis 3, 5. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good from evil. So he's giving them pieces of truth in all this, but how he's wrapping it and how he's manipulating it and twisting it a little bit is getting her um, in curiosity deeper and deeper. It's inflaming her nature to be curious in the wrong way. Genesis 3, 6, when the woman saw with the eyes first that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes... Saw and now we're thinking, we're looking, we're thinking that the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took from it, now we're acting out from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate simpleton. We all would have done it, I guess, though. Uh, sin begins in the mind, folks. That vision, that look, that thought, that quick thought. Sin begins in the mind long before it actually gives birth to action of sin, which is what really puts us outside the plan of God. We start following through. We allow that negative thought to roll around a little bit. Then it starts to become sin. But at first, when it's a flash, it's a thought, it's a look, if we can get a handle on it quickly, it won't turn into that sin. A negative or sinful thought can be quickly handled. It can be. It can be washed away. And that will not put you out of fellowship, folks. It doesn't. It's when it has time to dwell in your soul structure and then something gives birth to sin. That's what happens. James 1.15 explains it very well. Then when lust has conceived, lust is spinning around the thoughts in your mind. I want this, I want this, I want this. It's not always sexual either, so don't get that in your mind. It gives birth to sin. There it is. It has to come forth. And when sin is accomplished, when you've acted on it, it brings forth that death. Notice the series of events that happens, though. That lust has to happen. You have to look or see or think something. Then it has to kind of roll around in your mind and give birth. What happens during birth? Something's formed during birth, right? There's a nine-month pregnancy. There's a period that goes on. Then the baby comes forth. Then sin is accomplished. So think about it along those lines. It's the thoughts. Thoughts that give birth to actions. Meaning there's a point of no return, folks, where the thought is born into action. There is a point of no return and all that. Genesis 3-7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. They knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves, what, loincloths, coverings. Perfection and innocence was over at this point. It's over because they made a choice against God. They decided to become independent and listen to the advice of the serpent and also follow their own desire. You want to blame the serpent, but they followed their own desire. When somebody follows something that quickly, they wanted to do it to begin with. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes it just takes a little whisper, and you say, oh, okay, I'm going to run, but you are all gonna, already going to run in that direction. But perfection and innocence was over. And then what did they do? What's the next thing? They try to fix the sin issue themselves. They cover up the sin, which is all mankind can ever do. Cover up. Cover up the stain on the carpet, right? Only God can wash it clean. We cover it up. You move another piece of furniture over the stain, nobody can see it, but it's still there. God's the only one who can wash it clean. Genesis 3, 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God, Jehovah Elohim, in the Hebrew, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ, walking in the garden in the cool of the day, actually walking, yes, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. This is Jesus Christ, literally, walking and talking with the original uh, man and woman. Okay? Anytime you the, uh, the humanity of Christ... The humanity of, uh, we would say, the Trinity, which is Christ, is seen in the Old Testament even. It's Jesus Christ. Same guy, the same look, okay? Look at the chain sitting that happens, though. Look at this chain sitting that's going on between the man and the woman. 
one after the other after the other after the other. It's like a snowball. The independent choice against God, stepping away from God, becoming independent, we'll do it our way. Then the shame, then comes guilt, then this frustration. That leads to a cover-up. What are we going to do now? We've got to cover it up ourselves. Now they're going to run. Now they're going to run and hide from God. We all do this. Uh, just chain sinning, one after the other after the other. That's all it is. Genesis 3.9. Then the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? The author of the universe knows everything from the beginning from the end. Where are you? Does that make sense? Think about that for a minute. You know better. The Lord offers his grace and freedom. Grace and freedom for a man and woman to come forward, all of us, and he'll fix the problem. That's where the where are you is. He knew exactly where they are. He knew where they were a million years ago before he created them. He knew what was going to happen. That's that grace and freedom. That's God just giving that, that person, that sinful person, a chance to come back and just show themselves and open their heart up. God's grace, his mercy, and love are the only source of restoration. Grace, mercy, and love of God is the only source of restoration we'll ever get, folks. Not a self-help program. Genesis 3.10. He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid. Fear on top of shame and guilt and everything else. Because I was naked, so I hid myself. What does fear and shame and guilt do? What does it do? Separate us from God. Separate us from God. The Lord is aware of the fall from eternity past. This is true love. This is grace and mercy in action. This is grace and mercy in action. Exactly what I'm telling you. And who told you, right? Who told you? Let me see if I have that one. Where are you? That's Genesis 3.9. I might have skipped that one. You want to get that one. Where are you? The Lord offers grace and freedom for the man and woman. Absolutely does. Absolutely does. But then you look at this, Genesis 3.11, and he said, Who told you? Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The Lord is aware of the fall from eternity past, folks. This is true love, grace, and mercy in action. God wants us to acknowledge the sin. He wants us to acknowledge it. That's free will. That's real freedom. When somebody gives you the freedom to, to admit, not they don't come crashing down on you even though they know. They want you, he wants you to acknowledge the sin. And once you, once you do, he can actually deal with it. But you, there's something in us that has to come forward and open up and say, yes, okay, I, I need to turn back towards you. Genesis 3.12, the man said, the woman whom you gave me, this is the blame game, <laughs> we do this today, folks. The woman you gave me, God, you gave to be with me. She gave me the tree and I ate. Really, it's her fault, God. Okay? Genesis 3.13, Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is it that you've done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. They're passing the buck. Nobody wants to take responsibility. We see the Lord wants both to open up. He wants both of them. He wants them to acknowledge and open up their heart, what they, what they have done. And once they can do that, once they can take responsibility, he can then deal with the issue. Yet both Adam and Eve, or Ish and Eshaw, in the original language it said, take one step further, and they begin to try and manipulate the truth. Now the chain sitting goes on even longer when you think about it. Now they're manipulating truth and playing this little game of justification and rationalization. They do not accept full responsibility. Sound familiar? I know about my life sometimes. I do it. We all do, right? Jesus Christ immediately deals with Satan then. Immediately he turns to Satan. He knows what's going on, but he deals with Satan and he presents the foundation of the gospel message and the whole angelic conflict in just a few scriptures. He really does. Genesis 3, 15, 14, I'm sorry. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. Satan will continually have frustration continually have frustration as the dust of this angelic warfare will always end with God in a victorious position. He's always eating the dust at the end. God's always, you know, what, what is the, the roadrunner, the old school cartoon, the roadrunner and the coyote? And the, and the coyote's always trying to catch the roadrunner. He always ended up eating the dust. The, the roadrunner was always triumphant. God's always going to be triumphant. Genesis 3.15, I will do what? Put enmity, problem, strife, difficulties between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed he shall bruise you on the head you shall bruise him in the heel getting all into this is all the gospel of the coming cross of jesus christ this is pointing to humanity as a whole absolutely because we're talking about seed seed of a woman and the seed of humanity but more specifically excuse me the humanity of the coming savior lord and savior jesus christ interesting Jesus Christ is talking about his future self and all this when the hypostatic union finally happens uh, during the New Testament studies we've gone into. The seed of the woman also has the reference to what? That virgin birth 
The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was sinless perfection in his humanity. And it's actually the male, folks. The male is the one who passes down that gene, we would say, for the old sin nature. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in his humanity had the ability to sin, but never did. He had the ability, even though he had temptation put in his life, but he never did. No, he didn't have an old sin nature. He's perfect, right? He couldn't have an old sin nature because he's the virgin birth. He's the perfect one. His father was the father in heaven. It wasn't Joseph, okay? So we have to think about that as well. Well, these are all doctrines for another day. At this point, looking at the seed of mankind, though, it is clear what Paul wrote in Ephesians 2.1, telling us that we're born dead. You're born dead. We were born in sin because of the fall of mankind in the garden. Genesis 3.16, to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain... You will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Yes, first mentioned principle, a standard in the Word of God, okay? And everybody can get mad at me and call me a chauvinist. I didn't write the Bible. He will rule over you. This was a curse put on the woman. The woman, the real curse in all of it really is the childbirth. Not so much the man has to be an authority, because in life, in biblical principles, there's always authority. And the ultimate authority, obviously, is God himself. The woman was lacking in her discernment horribly. She really was. And she was doing things she shouldn't have been done. You know, you know, talking to a stranger she shouldn't have. A lot of, a lot of principles there. But honestly, deliberate sin was really not her issue. Deliberate sin. We can have ignorant sin where we claim we really didn't know. We still ended up sinning. And that's more or less where she was at. Genesis 3.17. Then to Adam, he said, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree, about which I commanded you to saying, you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you and toil. You will eat of it in all the days of your life. There we see a curse for man. Okay, Adam was responsible for what? The leadership in that household. He had a leadership and authority role, meaning, yes, the Bible is clear. The man is the head of the household. And Jesus Christ is the head of all of us. Just how, you know, the chain of command works, folks. And like I said, there's scriptures and uh, lessons for another day. We can get into that. But Adam failed. He failed in a leadership position and also went directly against the commandment of God. And God had been very clear with him. God had been teaching him the scriptures and, and Bible. We would say Bible doctrine, I guess, uh, from that point that he was created. Genesis 3.18. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, the ground will. You will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. In verse 19, you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. God's establishing now that nothing on earth will work in harmony from that point forward for man as it had been at this point, up until that point. The harmony of Mother Nature and the animals and you know him being in control over everything had just come to an end. Adam lost control of perfection and allowed Satan back into a position of authority on, in the earthly realm, which he held before. When I can get into that as well if you haven't uh, studied those uh, principles on when the earth was originally created and how the fallen angels were here first. Mankind would not live in harmony with animals and vegetation growing naturally up out of the earth to feed and shelter him anymore. Now it became a task. Now it became a struggle for mankind. And you won't see that perfect harmony with nature again, really, until the second advent of Jesus Christ after the seven-year tribulation period. Now, there are great studies wrapped up in all of these verses, okay? I can get lost in all of them. We could spend hours and hours, and someday we'll tear each of them apart. But our focus is on sin. More specifically, God dealing with sin, man's role in that as well. Genesis 3.20. Look at Genesis 3.20. Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living, the meaning. Genesis 3.21. The Lord God made garments of skin, this is important here, for Adam and his wife and clothed them. This is a blood sacrifice. Their failure, their sin, brought forth a death of something innocent, a blood sacrifice. This is established for sin. This is it right here. And the man and the woman accepted the covering. They opened themselves up to it and said, yes, we want you to fix it. We're coming to you. We want you to fix it. Genesis 3.22. You see the principles here? Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us. The Trinity right there. You, if you ever want to know the Trinity, it's all over the Bible. It starts right in Genesis. Knowing good and evil, and now he might stretch out his hand, take also from the tree of life, eat and live forever. And he would live forever in uh, his old sin nature. Genesis 3.23. Therefore... The Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he had taken. The man and the woman had their eyes opened. They had their eyes opened to a great deal of knowledge with a couple of simple bites of this tree of, God, of knowledge of good and evil. 
And in doing this, they, they gained a very clear sense of what mankind is capable of. The innocence and purity of the soul and the thought was now tainted. The conscience was pier pierced now. The old sin nature was popped wide open. The lid was popped off. The Trinity has knowledge of good and evil, anything. Thoughts, actions, everything. Nothing's hidden from the eyes of God. And man and woman got a little taste, a little bit, a little tiny bite of that. But God has the depth of holiness and power that can understand and cleanse evil. And mankind cannot do that and totally deal with it in its, in its totality. In fact, it just corrupts us more and more. So that's this little glimpse. Just this little glimpse of God's knowledge would lead to more curiosity and the possibility of the man or woman eating from the tree of life, which would ensure a sinful life forever. Okay? No hope of salvation for mankind if they got into staying there for a period of time and ate of that tree of life, which they eventually would. The curiosity would, because now their old sin nature is up and running. Genesis 3.24. So he drove the man out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Human arrogance, folks, the old sin nature itself, believes it can become a god unto itself, and therefore, left to its own devices, for a long period of time, it will take whatever glimpse of wisdom it has obtained and become very gluttonous and greedy for more and more. It will not seek God in the long run, but attempt to become like God. Human arrogance, the old sin nature, and we all have it, believes it can be a god unto itself. We see it all over in our world. And therefore, left to its own devices for a long period of time, it will take whatever glimpse of wisdom and truth it can have and obtain, and it'll become gluttonous for more, but it'll always twist and manipulate it into, to fit its, 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 its agenda, as I told you earlier. It will not seek God. It will not. It'll do the opposite, but it'll attempt to become like a god. Man will never rest. Never rest or be satisfied outside a relationship with God. Left to their own means, there is no rest in the old sin nature. And in fact, when you talk about hell, as the separation from God is hell. Because you're just left with all the raw emotions all the time. No forgiveness, no love. It's just separation from God. No purity, no, no compassion. None of those kind of things. The old sin nature just left to run wild. That's truly, really hell, separation from God. The old sin nature is considered to be a deep transgression a deep transgression within that divine judicial system in heaven and can only be dealt with by God in a sacrificial blood method that you just saw. Innocence for the guilty. Innocence blood for the guilty. Therefore, the old sin nature was dealt with once and for all on the cross, and we know that. The debt was paid once and for all time, yet we know mankind still fails and sins after salvation. If you don't, then you're lying to yourself. The good news is the old sin nature itself is nailed to that cross on Calvary for the born-again believer. So the old sin nature doesn't have to be a dividing agent between man and God if the person accepts the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as Savior. They now are not separated from God. They have eternal security. They're going to heaven. Now all they got to do is wash their feet clean, so to speak, when it touches worldly issues and worldly problems. Believers who sin only need acknowledge. The need for cleansing. Just acknowledge it. You don't have to scream out and cry. I mean, sometimes you do feel guilty about things, but it's just acknowledge the sin that you need to be cleansed. Then accept that Christ is the one capable of putting them in this unique position. You always have that in your mind. It's only Christ that can do this, my union with him. And you present your sin to God with no excuses and none of that justification, rationalization I was telling you about. Emotion and rational, rationalization need to be removed. Just name and cite the sin. You don't have to be caught up in emotions and rationalization. Name and cite the sin. Hand it over to God. Recognize, I'm in union with Christ. I'm, our, I'm already born again and saved. I'm, I'm secured forever. I failed in this area. My position is secure. This condition I can deal with because I have a Savior, a Mediator, a High Priest, a King, Lord of Lords taking care of it for me in the divine court of heaven. And it's already been paid. My old sin nature itself has already been paid for, the big one. These little sins that get the best of me on a bad day can be washed clean. You need to recognize that. Very important. Emotion rationalization really doesn't have a lot to do with it. And we're going to probably end up doing a two, a two more parts on this series at least to get to the bottom of everything I want to show you where the Spirit's leading me. So you need to understand that. Name and cite the sin. 1 John 1.9, we'll look at that as well in this series. Very important principle of 1 John 1.9. I thank you for your time. And as we um, get closer to this California conference we're going to do, 
I'll give you the information. I just got the generosity of uh, Matt and Kimberly. The, I got the email today. The plane tickets of getting secured, all that kind of stuff. So we're looking forward to uh, the end of June doing a weekend conference out there in California. And I'm hoping there's some folks on the West Coast who are interested or want to take vacation time, anybody all over the world, and come out and and uh, meet and greet. And uh, we'll do a Bible study and enjoy each other's uh, company and have some fellowship. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time. Please bless those that take these messages out to a lost and dying world. Father, we thank you for this time. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.